Isaiah chapter number 49. I do believe that if the only book of the Bible that God gave us was the book of Isaiah, we'd still be this many years later after it was penned down trying to wrap our heads around everything just in the book of Isaiah alone. In fact, oftentimes the book of Isaiah is called the Little Bible because there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. There's 66 books in your Bible. And everything from start to finish in the book of Isaiah, you can find Christ in the book of Isaiah. You can find God's plan of salvation in the book of Isaiah. You can find end time prophecy in Isaiah. You can find prophecy on how God was going to deliver Israel out from bondage that they were in at the time. You can find a whole lot in the book of Isaiah. But here at chapter number 49, I want to give you some context before we start reading. This is after Israel was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. When they came in, they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed Israel. They took all of the young men that had promised as captives. They were to be wise men in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Say the book of Daniel, if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Okay. Then, not only are they in captivity, they've been taken out of their homeland. Right? When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed Israel. It wasn't much more than just a pile of rubble by the time they got done with it. There wasn't anything of value there. They took all the gold, all the silver, all the precious gems, all the livestock. In fact, it's not unheard of, we don't have record of this in the Bible, but it's not unheard of that they would tamper with the fields where they would go crops and the farms so that things wouldn't grow anymore. Okay, many times throughout history, armies would take salt and they would trample them on the field so that nothing would grow in that field for many years. It was just a sign of, for lack of a better term, cruelty. Right? This people's not even worth enough that you shouldn't grow plants out of the ground that they used to own. Right? They would leave it desolate. So here are these people. They may not have been in bondage like they were in Egypt, but they had no place that they could go back to. There wasn't a home left. All that they had was to join up with the people that conquered them. That's why they did these kind of things, by the way. They gave them a choice. Either join us or you can stay here and die because there's nothing here left to support you. Okay, that's the people that Isaiah is writing to in this chapter. Okay? So we'll begin reading verse number 13. It says, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. But then look at the latter part of the verse. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Thy children shall make haste. Thy destroyers and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, I'm thankful again for the opportunity to preach. I pray that you'd hedge my thoughts tonight, Lord, that you'd help me bridle my tongue. And Lord, I pray that you'd get all the praise, honor, and glory for everything said and done tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Israel that Isaiah is writing to is a defeated Israel. We see that in verse number 14. It says, But Zion saith, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. They still recognize him as the Lord of Lords. That's why it's capitalized, if you got the right kind of Bible. L-O-R-D. That means the name of Jehovah. The Jews revered that name so much that they would not write it in its full form. They would abbreviate it. That's where the name Yahweh often comes from. It's because they took all the vowels out of the name Jehovah and they only wrote the consonants. Well, that's the abbreviation and the symbol in your English Bible that they wrote down the name of God himself. They said, we know the name of God. That shows a person, personability with God. God chose Israel, by the way, in case anybody forgot. It wasn't Israel that chose God. God chose to give them opportunity and occasion that they could get intimate and close with the Almighty God of heaven. It was God himself who spoke the name Jehovah to Israel. 
They didn't figure that out on their own. But yet they say that the Lord forsaken them and he's forgotten them. Not knowing that God's the one that chose them before there ever was a heaven or an earth. Their perspective was a little bit off, but even in that very verse, they write the name of God himself, not realizing that God didn't give his name to any other country. They should have realized that they were still a chosen people, that they were still God's people. And just because they weren't in the place that God once gave to them doesn't change the fact that he's still God. But, verse number 13, he starts off, notice he doesn't talk about people in this verse. He says, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. He's talking to the very land itself, talking to the sky. You guys do remember the verse in the Bible that says that if we don't praise the Lord, that rocks will cry out in our place? God knows that there's no praise to be found among His people. So He says, instead, I want the heavens I want the earth, I want the mountains to praise because God's chosen to do something. Well, what's he choose to do? Look at verse number 13 again. It says, For the Lord hath comforted his people. That's past tense. And will have mercy upon his afflicted. That's future tense. Yes, Zion, the people, that's what in verse number 14, Zion referring to Israel collectively. Right, the people of a place. And it says, Zion as a whole say, God's forgotten us and God hath forsaken us. Well, long ago, God comforted his people. Long before Isaiah was on the scene, there were many men of God that preached that judgment was coming. But that if you did right, God would keep you through the judgment. But then he also says, I want the heavens, I want the earth, I want the mountains to praise and sing forth. Why? Because God's going to do something about this affliction. God's getting ready to turn the tables, if you will, on the situation that Israel's in. Then, verse number 15, he gives an analogy. He says, how could God have forgotten about you and forsaken about you? He says, can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And then look at the answer. God answers his own question. It says, yea, they may forget. He chooses an analogy. You would think, well, Brother Jordan, surely a mother wouldn't think or forget about a newborn child. Look around in the world today. It happens all the time. In fact, it's one of the signs of the end times that women would lose their natural affection. It was one of the warning signs that God gave that his coming would be very soon. How many times have we heard stories about infants left in hot cars? Right. right? Or somebody driving to work and forgetting that they even loaded the kid up in the back of the car. Yeah. It happens all the time. We're human. Right? I've never been in that situation. But I've been busy enough to where I forgot to do the one thing that I wanted to do. Right. What do you say? We are flawed. Right. He uses a powerful example and says, even it, it, it even happens in those situations. And he says, but I'm not man. He says, I am God. Look at the end of verse number 15. Yet will I not forget thee. He says, even in the instances where you think that man would be good enough to remember about their responsibilities and their commitments and their promises, he says, even they forget. He says, but I'm not going to forget about you. He said, I'm not going to forsake you. Why? Verse number 16. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Who's he writing this to? He's writing this in context to Old Testament Israel. And it's not Christ that's speaking, it's God the Father that's speaking. If you study your Bible, Israel is the bride of the Father, and the church is the bride of Christ. God the Father is saying, I've graved thee in the palm of my hands. He says, everything that I do, very few times, but many, a couple of times in the Bible, you'll see where God bears his arms, or it references that God gets his hands to do business. He gets down to work himself. Well, you realize that every time that God the Father does something, he sees Israel in his hands? You realize that every time 
a holy God in heaven. Right? Makes a gesture. I mean, lean over to the Son who's seated, or seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You realize that he sees Israel? He made Israel a part of himself. That's how much he cared about them. That's how seriously God took the vows that he made to Israel. Because wasn't that his rebuke so many times to Israel that they left their first loves or that they left the vows of their espousals? God didn't forget. God made those promises a part of him very self. That's how important those vows were to God the Father. Then look with me in verse number 17. It says, Thy children shall make haste. He says, It may not come in this generation, but the next generation, your children, they're going to get out of Dodge. He says, They're going to have a place to go back to. A place that is theirs that was delivered to them by the very hand of God. And he says, Thy destroyers and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. In other words, they're going to get out of what should have been yours all along. And your children are going to be able to go back and take it, claim it. Now what they didn't understand is that in order for that to happen, God had already been up to business. You guys remember the book in your Bible called Esther? How there was a man that hated the Jews. He wasn't a king, but he was one of the king's generals. Wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. They had already decided that their towns and the land and everything else wasn't worth any value. And he finally got to the point that he just said, you know what, I'm tired of even looking at them. Let's just wipe them off the face. Let's get rid of all of them. God used a little maid to win over the heart of a king that later on gave birth to a fellow by the name of Darius who ended up being king in Daniel's day. You're telling me that God already wasn't working in, you know, uh, molding the hearts of not only that generation, but the generation after and after that, that they would be receptive to the things of God? He did it to Nebuchadnezzar on one day with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In one day, Nebuchadnezzar went from, everybody's got bowed down and praised his statue and don't mind the fact that it kind of looks like me, Okay. That's the true God, the Almighty God. Went from that in one day to, unless it's the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we ain't worshiping it. Amen. In one day. We know that we serve a God of miracles. He's a God that has all power. Amen. He can do whatever he wants to. Amen. So if God can do that in one day, imagine what he had been working behind the scenes for years up to this point. He says, you think that I've forgotten you and forsaken you because I haven't answered your prayers the way that you want them to be answered. He said, but even before you prayed those prayers, I got my hands to work. And he says, and every time I look down at what I'm working on, I see your names in the very palms of my hands. He says, I know exactly where you're at. I know exactly what you're going through. And he says, and I've already been at work. And he said, instead of letting the heavens and the earth and the mountains praise at the fact that I've done something, how about it dawn on you and you get to praise in a little bit? That's the rebuke in those verses. He said, the heavens can sing. Right? The earth can praise. The mountains can be joyous. But what are you doing? We're not going to preach on any of that. You're all about ready to have a heart attack. I want to look at verse number 16. Now I want to first acknowledge that yes, nowadays under the grace dispensation, we can look at verse number 16 and see a little bit of prophecy. That Christ, as we just heard and sung about, right, went to a old rugged hill, laid himself down. Right, They didn't have to constrain him to lay on the cross. He laid himself down on the cross after he bore the cross up that hill. And they pierced his hands and his feet. Later they thrust his side after he had already given up the ghost to prove that he was dead. And in those nail prints, certainly Christ engraved your name if you're one of the believers. Amen. If you've been saved, you were made a part of Christ. That's why it says that he's in us and we're in him. Right? We, in the eyes of the Father, are the same as Christ. 
Right? Christ made the church a part of himself, just like God the Father made Israel a part of himself. Right? Isn't that just like the Son to do things just the way that the Father had done things originally? Isn't it? I mean, it's no wonder that Christ would do the same thing when it says that his ways change not. They're established from forever. Right? God just does things certain ways. So certainly, in the church age, have no doubt about it, you're engraved in the palms of Christ. Amen. If you got in through the blood, he's got your name recorded in himself. Amen. Because he paid for your debt specifically. But, I want to look at the latter half of that verse. It says, Thy walls are continually before me. Now, people like to talk about the beginning, verse number 16. Don't hear off a whole lot about the end of verse number 16. Who's he talking to? Well, he refers to them in verse number 14 as Zion. Okay, you know where Zion is? That's another name for Jerusalem in the surrounding area. He's talking to the people that came out of the very city of God. Right, that's what Jerusalem is often called. He's talking to God's people that came from God's city. And he's telling them, just because you're over here, I know exactly where you're at. You're engraved in the palm. Nobody could have taken you somewhere unless I permitted it. And he says, but your walls are always in front of my eyes. In other words, he's saying, I've got a good gist, okay, of not only where you're at, but I understand everything about where you came from. Now, we've already said, the city of Jerusalem was raised. Right? There was no brick standing on top of another brick by the time they got done. The walls at this point didn't exist. But yet God says, I've still got my eyes on the walls. So I've been chewing on that for a little bit, these walls that God had his eyes on. Right, well, with the Lord's help, we're going to preach on tonight, the walls that God looks at. The walls that God looks at. Now these walls that were around the city of Jerusalem, why are they so important? The world would have said they're useless. They've been torn down. It's not even a wall anymore. But see, here's the way that God works. If God put a wall up, it doesn't matter what the world does to it, God still sees a wall. Right? There's a whole other message in that. It doesn't matter what the world sees in you, all that matters is what God put in you. Well, God's already promised them in verse number 17 that their children are going to go back. They're going to make haste. They're going to be able to get back to that place called Zion. And he says, I've already got my eyes on the walls. Now, if you want to do a little bit of cross-study, go to the book of Nehemiah. God had already put it into the heart of a king that he had a cupbearer. And that cupbearer found favor in the eyes of the king. And the king said, I'll give you one request. Whatever it is, for all your years of service, you've never had a bad attitude. You've always done everything I've said. What's the one thing that you want to do? And he says, I want to go back and build up my home. I want to go fix the walls of Jerusalem. God already knew that was going to happen. God says, the world sees it just as a bunch of rubble. But I've already got a plan to put the wall back where it was. And you know what they used to do it? The pieces that were left over from the wall the first time. God said, I gave you those rocks for a reason. We're going to use them. He says, I've already got a plan on how it's going to happen. And go study it out. It was no less than a miracle that that wall got put around that city in as little time as it did. They truly were running off of, you know, the touch of God. With enemies all around them, having to, in one hand, hold a hammer, and in the other one, hold a weapon. They got the thing built. God says, I've got my eyes on the walls. That's literally what he's talking about. But see, if God cares about the wall, even when it's got cracks in it, even when it's crumbling and falling over, why is that wall still so important to God? That is just a wall. Well, see, the walls of a city, by implication, the first thing they do is they show a purpose. Those walls were put there for a reason. There's something on the other side of those walls that's pretty special. Now you can go read another book of your Bible. Okay? 
you get first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles. Then you get Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. We've already mentioned two of them. Guess what the other one we're about ready to talk about? Ezra. Guess what Ezra did? While Nehemiah was busy on a wall, Ezra went back and restored the temple. And you know what you find out? You find out that all those things that were taken away, all those vessels of honor that were in the house of God, all the instruments that were used in the ministries of the priest, guess what? God kept them all safe. Just because Israel didn't have them didn't mean that God didn't have them. You know why the wall was put there? The wall was there to separate the things that wished to defile the things of God and the house of God. Because guess where the house of God was? It was in Jerusalem. That's why it was a God city. They made a place, a habitation, that God could dwell among his people in the very city that if you remember Melchizedek that we heard about last week? Yeah, you know the city that Melchizedek was king over? Guess what it was? It was Jerusalem. God picked that city long before Israel ever did. And God says, I've got my eyes on the wall. The wall's going to be put back. The symbology behind that, or symbolism behind that, is that God wasn't going to build the wall unless he saw something that was worth having a wall around it. The wall draws a line. There's things inside the wall and outside the wall. Yet God is very concerned with the lines that God originally drew. That's why God's eyes were still on that wall. It may have been in ruins, may have just been a bunch of rubble, but it was still built on the line that God said, this is right and that is wrong. I don't care what the world does to the walls that we try to put up, there's still a difference between right and wrong. You know what he's telling Israel in these verses? He's saying, I can still see the difference, that line between what you should be and what you shouldn't be. He says the whole reason that you've suffered this affliction is because Israel wasn't what they were supposed to be. There's things that God finds acceptable and unacceptable. He says the purpose of this wall is to separate the things that are mine from the things that are the world's. And you know why the wall was destroyed in the first place? Because long before the wall ever came down, people tore the wall down in their hearts and they let the things of the world get into the things of God. And it wasn't a new thing. It happened little by little. Slowly but surely. Like an infection. You can ignore it for a little bit, but eventually it's going to get so bad that you can't deny it anymore. And usually by that point, it's too late. Amen. Usually by that point, something drastic has to happen to save the rest of the body from the part of it that got infected. What do you think that the judgment that God sent was to do? It was to cut out the infection so that he could save those that were still alive. But they had to suffer the affliction. Why? Because it doesn't matter if your brother did it, if your neighbor did it, you were still a part of the people that did it. Go read the book of Daniel. Never once does Daniel say that the sins of Israel were the people's sins or their sins. He always says, our sins. He says, our faults. He says, our mistakes. Because it happened on their watch. God said that we were supposed to stand in the, the gap and make up the hedge. Well, there were people that weren't. They're just as responsible as those that were committing the things that were wrong because they didn't stand up and say anything about it. Right now, just like in Nehemiah's day and in Ezra's day, maybe with what happened last week, God's given a little space where he's been working on the hearts of people that the world and churches would consider worldly people in a place called Washington, D.C. But maybe God's just been working on their hearts that they're going to turn around and ask somebody, hey, is there anything that I can do for you? Yeah, I'd like to re-strengthen those walls. I'd like to build up some barriers between what's right and what's wrong. Right? I'd like to restore things the way that they used to be when God had his hand upon our people. Because that's what the wall, without the wall, there's no reason to put anything on the other side of it. 
People can still come in and just take it whenever they want to. The wall is the symbol that, no, there's a purpose going on behind this. Right? Not just anybody can come in. you got to be special to get in on the other side of this wall. Right? God's got to have his name on you like your hand or your name is engraved in his hand in order for you to get on the other side of this wall. Right? We don't let just anybody come in and start messing with the things of God. Right? These things are special. They're different. That's why cities back in the day started. People that had the same beliefs and people that had the same ideologies and had the same goals, they would band together and eventually they'd put up a wall to say, this is different than the rest of that. This belongs to us. This is ours. We've taken it. We've claimed it. And we're going to make sure that what happens on the other side of this wall conforms to our group ideals. Right? That's, that used to be what churches were. There were walls that were built around them that said, that's God's. Don't care what you say, that's still God's. You don't get to dictate what happens on the other side of that wall. God does. Amen. And maybe, right, God's just given an opportunity that one of these days in the next couple of years, he's going to say, I'm rebuilding some of the walls that the world's tried to tear down. Right, because there's a purpose on the other side of those walls. Second, Walls also offer protection. Right? God cared about those walls because those walls do have a purpose in and of themselves. Not just the purpose that's going on behind the walls, but those walls have a job to do. Right? These are not walls like those walls. It's not drywall. Okay? These walls were made out of rock, and they were thick. They were made to withstand an invading army. That's why they had to tear it down to where it was flat again. Right? Even with a little bit, it's still a wall. It's still a barrier. It's something that impedes somebody from getting to the inside. Right? The wall protects. Well, when God says, the walls are before my eyes, He's saying, I've got your safety on my mind all the time. He's saying, you think that you're exposed because there is no wall? He says, I see the walls that I've put in your life that no man can touch. Yeah, they're in a foreign land, but guess what? God's allowed them to grow and be prosperous. You'll find that those that did right according to God, no matter what the world did to them, God just kept promoting them. All right, again, go read the book of Daniel. Right? We already said Esther made her queen. What'd they do? They just did that which was right in the eyes of God. They just followed what God said was right. They stayed on this side of the wall, even though it wasn't there anymore. And God had a hedge around them. Right? In fact, we mentioned it today in Sunday school, book of Job. Right? The devil said, you've blessed him too good. The hedge is too thick. Right? I can't even get to Job to start messing with Job because you've got him so well protected. And God said, I'll take it away. Right? God always knows. Not just where you are, but God knows how to protect you where you're at. Amen. Do you realize that it was a miracle in and of itself that any of them survived? Let alone that the king just had the thought one day, you could call that coincidence if you want to. I'd call it divine intervention. But the king said, give me the strongest and the smartest and the ones that could be the best benefit to it. I'm going to make them a part of my very group of advisors. From the get-go. The king knew that there was value in the people of God. Right? Even when some other people said there's no value in them, God made a way that there was value in them, not just uh, the king, but uh, the other people that lived with them. You understand that it was a miracle that they weren't ostracized? That they could even buy and sell and get gain? Right? Study history. Anytime there's a group of others, guess what happens most of the time? They're kept on the outside, on the fringes, hoping that they just die off because they don't want to deal with them. They're treated like an inconvenience. But yet you find that they thrive. And not only that, that God didn't just protect them, He protected everything that they used to own. Just because they didn't own it anymore didn't mean that God didn't own it. Where were they? They were kept in the storehouses and in the treasuries of the king. That's the safest place that they could have been. 
You know who could have given the command to use them? The king and the king only. They couldn't be misused. In fact, the king said, hey, you know those things that we took away? When he sent Ezra and Nehemiah back. He said, you know all those things that we took? Give them back to them. And then he went once, he said, in fact, all the materials that they need, all the food, everything that it's going to cost, put it on my tab. Literally, God moving on their behalf. They didn't even have the resources to do it, so God gave it to them out of the king's piggy bank. God says, I know exactly where you're at. Why? Because once again, engraved in his hands. He says, everywhere I go, I take you with me. Everywhere that you go, I'm right there in the midst of you, whether you realize it or not. But he says these walls are important because it's a symbol of God's protection. Do you realize that it tarnished the very name of God for God's city to lay in ruins? Because that was something that Israel's stake belonged to God, and yet the world came in and destroyed it. That wall, right? God said, we're going to rebuild it so that you can once again show the world it doesn't matter what you do to these things that we own. It doesn't change who God is. Right now, some of y'all are in here tonight. You need to know. You may not be where you thought you would be. You may not be in the middle of a people, right, out in the world that you would have thought that you would have been around. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have you exactly where he wants you. And that while you're there, God can't keep you perfectly as you were. You know how Israel got delivered out of this, not captivity, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Affliction. You know how they got delivered out? Same way that they were delivered in. They were still God's people. In the eyes of God, their status had not changed. You know how they left? They left as God's people. They didn't leave as a defeated people. They didn't leave as a conquered people. They left with God's seal on them. And guess how they came back? The same way. Did they have to fix some things? And did they have to repent of some things? Yeah. But they were still God's people. Right? God's got you right where either you need to be or right where you decided that you needed to be. Those are two different things. But either way, God's still got an eye on the things that are protecting you. Amen. Just because the world tears them down doesn't mean that they're not there anymore. Right? They may have torn down the symbol of God's protection, doesn't mean that God still can't protect you. Right? But if you get things made right, God may just rebuild that symbol in your life. That just when the world thought they won, no, no, God just built the wall again. Just as a testament to the fact that even without a wall, God can still protect you. Right, but these walls also. Okay, not just purpose, not just protection. But God cared about these walls because of peace. The walls were a symbol of hope. They were a symbol of safety. Right, when kids at night would have nightmares about Assyrians or Babylonians or whoever in the closet. Right? Mamas and daddies would open the window up and they'd say, you see that wall right there? As long as that wall's there, no bad guy can get inside of the wall to come and get you. Right? When mother and father heard that wars were breaking out across the land, they could look to the walls and say, God made it to where this city's safe. And they could take peace in that. At some of y'all tonight, your wall of peace has been torn down. God says, I see right where it's at. I see all the pieces that make it up. Guess what? The rocks haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is that you've stopped believing in those rocks. You say, well, they're torn down. I saw what God did with five rocks one day and a fellow that wasn't even full grown yet. His name was David. God doesn't need a wall. God needs himself. That's it. He doesn't even need you. But because you're engraved in the palm of his hands, he cares about you. He cared about you so much that he drove your name through his hands and his very feet. He wants you to be at peace. Right? He promised that in certain times of your life, you'd have a peace that passeth all understanding. Even when you don't understand how you have peace, God wants you to have peace. 
God wanted His people to once again have that sense of safety and security and peace within their souls. He wants the same thing for you today. This would have been a totally different message if Kamala won, because some of y'all would have had your peace robbed for four years. Some of y'all are laughing, but I know it'd be true for some of y'all. It would have ruined your day, your week, your year, and then the next four. That's all that we would have heard out of people's mouths. They would have had no peace. They would have been worrying. Right? They would have looked like they just did four years in the White House at the end of it. They'd have a whole lot more gray hair, a whole lot more wrinkles, and they'd look like they'd been put through the ringer. That's not what God wants for you. God wants you, regardless of what condition you are in, to be able to lean on the everlasting arms. God, in the midst of a storm, even if the storm gets a name like Eurachlodon, he wants you to be able to be in the inner part of the ship at peace. You know what the Apostle Paul was doing in the middle of that storm? He was talking to God. He said, the angel of the Lord stood before me. Right, we heard about that also. Angel of the Lord in the Old Testament and in the New. You know what that is? It's Jesus. And he said, hey, Jesus and I just talked. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to lose the ship and we're going to lose everything on the ship, but the people are going to be fine. And instead of giving them peace, some of them got a little worried. Till the centurion put his foot down and said, do whatever that guy says. Then they get to the island. I don't find where the apostle Paul freaked out when a snake came out of the fire and bit him. Said that he shook it off. Then he went back to work. Not, the storm couldn't do it. The serpent couldn't do it. What could steal the apostle Paul's peace? Nothing. Why? Because God gave him that wall. And some of y'all had that wall thrown out. God wants to rebuild that wall for you. He wants you to be able, regardless of what you're facing, to say, can't touch the wall that God gave me. Can't touch the things in my life that God put there and nobody else but God can take away. You know why the wall came down? Because they stopped having faith in the one who put it there. There was nothing special about the wall in the first place. What was special is who had his hand on the wall. Now, then last point. Don't get too excited. We got sub points on this one. God also sees the walls that are inside of people. You know what walls come before the eyes of God? The walls that you put up in your life. God's real concerned about them walls. Because you know what those walls do? Those walls keep you from being verse number 17 where you can make haste and get back to where God desires you to be at. Those walls are not something that improves your life. They're things that are impediments to your life. Right? It's good to have locks on your doors. You guys ever seen those videos where for comic effect they play up there, there's like 400 locks on the door? At a certain point, locks don't make sense anymore. All it's doing is keeping you from being able to get out. And it takes you 40 minutes to get back in because you got 900 keys. And you got to undo and then redo all of them locks. Right? There's a difference between making something safe and then going overkill. Well, there's a lot of God's people that have gone overkill with walls in their life. There are a lot of people that have built things up that they thought were going to be for their betterment, but instead, it's for their harm. You say, what are some of those walls? Well, let's start off with the first one of false walls. Yeah, you guys ever see them houses? That from afar, it looks like they've got natural stone rocks that were laid out by hand and you walk up and you tap on it and it's actually just plastic that was screwed to the side of the house that's a false wall that's not rock it's made to look strong it's made to look pretty but then people were cheap so they found a way to do it to where you didn't have to buy the real rocks and hire a mason in order to put the whole wall together you could just do it with a screwdriver and a saturday if you had enough you know caffeine now, that's not a real wall you know why that wall's there? The wall's there to give somebody else a different impression than the wall that is there. It's a false wall. There's a whole lot of people that have walls in their life that are just made up of masks that they wear so that other people see it. Some people build walls so that they can decorate them to try and impress the people on the other side of the wall. There's just one problem with that. Didn't we already say 
that if you're saved, you're in the very palm of God. There's evidence and proof in heaven today that he did what he did for you. You know what that means? You were enough the way that you were for God to care about you then. You're still enough the way that you are now for God to care about you today. Doesn't matter what the world has an opinion or what other people in the church's opinion is. All that matters is what you are and what God wants to do with you. But as long as that wall's there, you're not coming to terms with who you really are. You're more concerned about what you aren't rather than what you are. Well, there's just a slight problem. It doesn't matter what you aren't because you never will be that. You know how God made you? To his pleasure. You know what spiritual gifts God gave unto you? The ones that he wanted to give to you. You know what God blessed you with? The things that he desired you to be blessed with. You can either claim what God's done for you or by trying to be something else, what you're saying is, what God's given me isn't enough. When we're putting up those false fronts and we're building those fake walls to impress other people, right? why is the opinion of man so valuable to some people? Right? I understand that peer pressure is a real thing and we think it only happens to teenagers in schools. That's not true. It happens every day on the job. It happens when you go talk to the lady behind the counter at a gas station. You say what's expected, not what's true. And why the opinions of man? They change every second of every day. The other person doesn't even care about what they care about or else it would stay the same longer than a week or longer than a news broadcast. You know why people say the things that they say to make themselves feel better? All they care about is themselves. So why in the world would you seek validation from somebody who doesn't care about anything other than themselves? When you've got a holy God who literally laid down his life and took it back up again just for you. I think his opinion would matter a whole lot more than somebody who you're never going to be able to win the approval of. But all of those false walls. Well, yeah, I'm strong enough to handle it. No, you're not. Because if you were, Christ wouldn't have had to come. Even if Christ came to save you, you're still not strong enough. That's why the Holy Ghost had to come. The Comforter. Because you're not strong enough to bear it on your own. That's why he didn't say, take up your own yoke. No, he said, take my yoke upon you. Amen. He said, you can't handle pulling it on your own, so just pull it with me. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm strong enough. I'm intelligent enough. I've got enough common sense or whatever standard it is that you want the world to see. It's better to let God tear down that wall. Because you know what the world is actually looking for? A wall that has God written all over it. A wall that stands up to the test. Because if you built the wall, the wall can come down real easy. It doesn't take an act of God like Jericho for that wall to fall over. It just takes a strong breeze. Because again, it may look pretty on the outside, but it's held together with duct tape and zip ties and everything else on the backside. And all it takes is just one moment of you not trying to impress people for the mask to come off. God's got his eyes on that wall too. Not just the wall, or false walls. There's also a wall of fear. There's a wall that people put up to keep people out because they're afraid. Why? Many reasons people can be afraid. People can be afraid because they've been hurt. People can be afraid because they've got a lack of faith. People can be afraid because they believe that God can save them, but that God can't keep them. People can be afraid because of things that other people say, because of intimidation. That's one of the tools of the devil, to intimidate you so that he can dominate you. Why? To isolate you. Get you to where you are alone and he can have his way with you. That's one of the steps in the process. People are afraid for a lot of reasons. God's got his eyes on those walls because he wants you to put your faith in the fact that God's bigger than all your fears. You don't think that David, right, just some scrawny, ruddy dude from the backside of a mountain that was watching sheep, in his flesh, wasn't afraid of Goliath? 
I talked about it in Sunday school today, that dude that had already signed to play at Ohio State. I looked like a toddler next to that dude. And I was a senior in high school. Okay? Before I went on that field, I was like, oh, that dude's big. Right? Still went out there, still went head to head with him. Right? But there's that thought in the back of his head, I'm sure, that was like, what did I get myself into? Lord, you've got to do this because there's no hope if I sling this rock. Now, what did he say? He said that he was going to go out and fight him, not because he was strong enough, not because he had enough manhood behind him, not because he had enough gumption, but he said, you've defied the very name of the God that I love, and God's going to whoop you. Amen. Go study it out. That's what he said. He said, I'm not going to do a thing. God's going to do it. Amen. You know why he said that? Because he looked at Goliath and said, there's nothing I can do about that problem. It's got to be God. But yet that fear didn't cripple David. The fear of a lion's den didn't keep Daniel from bowing on his knees three times a day, facing towards the holy city of Jerusalem, and praying to God. Were there things that intimidated them? I'm sure in the flesh. But spiritually they had that wall that we talked about, a peace. They knew that God said to do it and it was right to do. They knew that God was bigger than all their fears. David wasn't even afraid for himself, but the king was. He came running out first thing in the morning. Hey, is your God still able, Daniel? And he goes, oh, king, live forever. Of course he is. He sent an angel down here shut the lion's mouth. I've been using them as pillows all night. They kept me warm down here in the middle of this ice-cold cave. Daniel had no fear for the situation. Why? Because he had his faith. And a God that was bigger than a lion's den and bigger than a king and bigger than any situation. He had already tested and improved him. You know why people have fear? Because they've forgotten what God's already done for them. You know why Daniel didn't have fear? Because Daniel was there when him and his buddies just basically ate, you know, uh, broccoli soup for like a week. And yet somehow they put on more muscle and they were healthier than the dudes who were going down to the meat buffet every day. Because they said, we're not going to eat that because God said that's not right. We'll eat the bare bones that you guys can give us. We'll just eat some lentils. But watch and don't see if God does something because of our faithfulness. And he did. And time after time, Daniel had tested, put his faith in God, and God always rewarded it. That's why he had no fear when they came and said, if you keep praying, we're going to throw you in the lion's den. He said, well, you can try. I had three buddies y'all tried to throw in the furnace one time. You remember how that went? They said, they met Jesus on the inside. If I got to be thrown into the lion's den in order to meet Jesus, then go ahead. We don't find evidence that that happened, although you can't convince me that that angel that God sent wasn't the angel of the Lord. Because God's no respecter of persons. If he was waiting on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed to go inside of the fire, why wouldn't he have been waiting for Daniel on the inside of the cave? They didn't forget what God had already done. That's why they had no fear. In fact, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed, guess what the first thing that came out of their mouths to the king? We are not careful to answer the old king. In other words, we're not afraid of you. Why? That wall couldn't be built in their hearts because every time they thought in the flesh about, well, how's this going to turn out? God's going to handle it. He handled the last day. He handled the day before that. He handled the time we got thrown into the fire. He made sure that we weren't killed when the whole nation was conquered. Then instead of being slaves, he puts us up as wise men in the king's house. Right? We're sleeping on beds nicer here than we had back home. He said, God's going to take care of it. You cannot be fearful when you still stand in awe of what God did for you before. When you're impressed with what God's done before, it's real hard to be fearful. Right? We've talked about the false walls. We've talked about fear. And there's also a wall of feebleness. A wall that you put up with all the reasons on why you can't. Well, there's just one piece to that problem. Nowhere in the Bible do I find that I can do anything in and of myself for God's honor and glory. The arm of flesh is going to fail me. You've built a wall up with all the reasons why you can't. And God said, it's not about you. 
All I want you to do is make yourself available, and then God's going to do the rest of it. You don't think that somebody like the Apostle Paul didn't have enough reasons on why he couldn't be used of God? He literally had the warrants to kill Christians on the road to Damascus. And, according to his own testimony and what he wrote, he intended to carry them all out. He held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. So you can't convince me it wasn't somehow part of the orchestration to make sure that he received the death penalty. He was one of the Pharisees. Right, people knew who he was. People knew what he had done. Right, later we come to find out he had at least one thorn in the flesh that God said that he wouldn't take away. Right, so people speculate it was his eyesight. Who knows? But it was something that was a hindrance, but he didn't let it become a wall of feebleness. Because guess what God promised him? My grace is sufficient for thee. And he just had more faith in the grace of God than he did in the strength of his own flesh. Right? We saw Moses say, Lord, let me take Aaron. I can't talk well. You know, I've got a stutter. I don't find where Aaron ever said a thing. Somewhere between Moses getting the call and Moses showing up at Pharaoh's house, he got rid of that wall of feebleness in his heart. Yeah. Samson literally looked like, you know, didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or the Hulk or anything. No, he looked like a dude that was about that big and that if you blew at him too hard, he would fall over. Samson was a scrawny dude. That's why they were all amazed at the fact that he went out and whipped all those Philistines. In fact, the king, when they finally did capture him, they mocked him. And they said, this is the guy that caused you all so much trouble? Yeah, because it wasn't about him. It wasn't about all the reasons that he couldn't. He just believed that God could. He had more faith in the vow that he made to God than he did in his own body. So many people throughout the Bible aren't the best or the strongest or the smartest. Who are they? They're the ones that were most sincere. As long as you've got that wall of feebleness, you can't, nobody including God's ever going to be able to convince you otherwise that God can do great and mighty things in your life through you because all you see is the wall of excuses that you built. Well, there were a whole lot of excuses on why you couldn't get saved, and God broke through that wall too. Why don't you let him just break through the wall of all the excuses on why he can't use you? All right, but the last wall that's in people's hearts is that wall of pride. That's the wall of uselessness. Because until you tear down that wall, you're never going to conform to what it is that God wants you to be. That wall of pride, that's the wall of fight. You're fighting against what it is that God wants you to have. God's got his eyes on that wall too. There are things behind there that you want to keep separate from the things of God that's just one problem. It's all a part of you. You can't separate yourself into pieces and components and, well, today I'm going to pick up the coat that says I'm a good Christian and tomorrow I'm going to pick up the coat that says it's okay to live like this because I don't have to go to church tonight. Or the preacher's out of town so I don't have to wear my best suit to church this week. All the reasons as to why you can keep those two things separate, they're all false. It's all a part of you. And you know what God wants? You. He doesn't want part of you. He said he engraved you in the palm of his hands. You know what that means? All of you. He didn't just engrave part of you. He saved all of you. He's taken all of you to heaven. He didn't just buy part of you. He bought everything in the kitchen sink too. He wanted all of you. It wasn't that he settled for all of you. No, that's what he desired. And as long as you've got that wall where you're fighting against the things that you won't turn over to God, it's already his. He bought it. And you're only tempting the grace of God that he doesn't break you so that that wall comes crumbling down. It's what he did to Pharaoh's heart when he refused to let God's people go so many times. He said that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. How many times until it broke? 
God may send things into your life just to make you harder and harder until you finally crack. That's a much more painful experience than making yourself malleable to the things of God and letting them form you like the potter's clay into what you ought to be. Because God can take that rock and he can turn it back into clay, but it involves a whole lot of crunching and pounding and sifting until it's back into a fine powder that he can turn back into clay. You know why that happens in people's lives? Because they've got that wall of fight. They're going to go tooth and nail arguing with God himself on what is or is not acceptable in the eyes of God. You know where that wall of fight is built? Just a couple of feet past the wall that God wants them to use. On the line between where God says this is, this is right and this is wrong, that wall's just a little bit this way. Oftentimes it's over menial things. Things that don't make a difference. Things that don't have a great value in your life. It's just the fact that you want to do them. That's why pride's so dangerous. Pride doesn't only come, you know, come up on important things. Pride argues over the smallest details because your flesh likes being right. But God says, let's tear down that wall and let's build that wall that I gave you originally. Let's take down that wall because you know what that wall does? It separates you from God. You want to live behind that wall, well, that puts you between this wall and the wall that God originally had. That's a lonely existence. That's called no man's land. Because no man can live there. You can't live separated from everything, including the Savior that has your best intentions at his heart. You do realize when he said that they were engraved in the palms of the sand, when Christ said that you were in him and he's in you, not one second of your day are you not on the mind of God. For one instant, there isn't a moment where God doesn't have your complete life under his total control and he safeguards it. That he cares so much about you that he has God the Son in Christ seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession or prayer to God the Father for you. God, even though he's God, cares enough about you that God himself prays for you. That he became your high priest, not because it got him anything, but so that he would be able to succor you regardless of whatever situation you go through life in. Because it said that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin. He conquered it all so that he could help you be victorious through it. So much of what he did was because he cared about all of you. He could have just saved us and that had been enough, but that's not how God does things. He bought you hook, line, and sinker. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Because he saw the value of what you would be once God got done conforming you to the image of his son. When he saved you, he tore down a whole lot of walls in your life that sin had put up. And he just put one up. And you know what that wall's made out of? It's made out of this thing called the solid rock. He made it of himself. You know what separates you from the world? God does. Because he bought you and he puts you behind himself. He puts you behind his hand, behind his hedge. He puts you underneath of his wings, as the psalmist said. Amen. That's what separates you from the world. God said, if you want to get to them, you've got to go through me. Did he not say that we're in his hand and his hand's in the Father's hand? He actually said, you've got to go through God twice if you want to get to them. Amen. So when you let that wall be torn down in your life between where God wants you to live and where God wants you to be separated from, you're tearing down the very presence of God in your life. And it is a, it, would it be any wonder that if you want God out of your life so bad that so much hurt and so much harm and so much destruction can happen? Because the very person that loved you more than you understand what love is is the person that you just tried to kick out of your life. He loved you so much that he not only bought you, he's willing to protect you until you get back home to heaven. And you say, I don't want that in my life. Can you imagine the hurt that that does to the very heart of God? 
But yet, even though we do that some days, Jesus still doesn't stop making intercession for you. Just because that's how you treated him, thankfully that's not how he treats us. Today may have been the day that God made specifically for you to get some walls fixed in your life. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.